This is University Lecture. Welcome to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, Dr. William C. McCormick of the McFarland Clinic in Ames speaks on treatment of respiratory distress in the newborn. Dr. McCormick. The main problem we're going to talk about today is the problem of respiratory distress of infants. <laughs> this used to be called hyaline membrane disease. It occurs in prematures, infants of diabetic mothers, and infants whose mothers have bled into the amniotic fluid during the last trimester of pregnancy, or sometimes during delivery. This kills about 25,000 babies a year in this country. We're not sure how many babies have brain damage afterwards. They're not quite as many as would at first be suspected. The babies are born with slight difficulty breathing. The difficulty increases over the next several hours. And then it's quite obvious that they have great difficulty breathing. They'll breathe at rates of 120 per minute, 100 to 120, the normal being about 40 per minute. The, when you and I have trouble breathing, we increase the depth of respiration. These babies are built in such a way that they cannot. Their bellies are too big and their chests are too small, and it's much more physiologically economic for them to increase the rate of respiration rather than the depth. They have difficulty doing this, however, because their ribs are elastic. They're still cartilage. And when they contract the diaphragm, the, di the diaphragm is a domed muscle, and when it contracts, the dome gets less conical, and pulls down. But in the baby, instead of increasing the intrathoracic capacity, it just pulls the ribs in. The other difficulty is that it's very difficult to help these kids breathe. The pH of the baby's blood is absolutely dependent upon the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood at any given time, along with some other things, but that's one of the major variables. If you try to breathe for a baby, his pH control is so sensitive that if you breathe a little bit slow for him and the carbon dioxide builds up, his blood becomes more acid and he's uncomfortable. If you breathe a little bit too rapidly, it becomes less acid, he's uncomfortable. So rather than accept your rate of respiration for him, he'll quit. Now, he may not quit forever, but he quits long enough so that uh, this is not a good way to breathe for babies unless you want to overwhelm his own protective mechanisms and breathe for him whether he likes it or not. We have the force to do it. The two fingers on an anesthesia bag is enough to break down a baby's resistance. But then you have to monitor the baby's blood so carefully to make sure that his acidity doesn't change, because if it does, his enzymes don't work, and if his enzymes don't work, he dies. You have to monitor it so carefully, uh, monitor it so carefully that it's, it's a real major procedure. Any pediatric resident has seen these babies deteriorate under his fingertips. And this was a real problem when I was going to school because no one knew what to do for them. You threw them into the uh, incubator and you gave them oxygen. You didn't dare give them too much for, for fear of blinding them. And if uh, you gave them antibiotics, in the hopes they were infected and you had something you could do something. And digitalis, if you happened to be using it that year. It, re it really was a frustrating thing. Because if these babies lived, they were normal. 
And if they could make it for the first two days, first 48 hours, then they almost always lived. The disease was gone in five or six days, and they were perfectly normal children. But they just couldn't last. They wore out. And when we started this work, the physiologists of the world had decided primarily what was wrong with these babies, what should be done for them. Everyone had tried breathing for them. But at 120 a minute, that's, that's quite an order. You don't knock them out that fast, and you can't tilt them up and down that fast. Their, their bellies are too big, and the intestines don't move enough to pull any air into the chest anyway. And the big problem was how to breathe for the baby. It was thought that if you could breathe for him, you could make it. With physiologic determinations, we found that the main thing wrong was that the lungs were stiff. They would not expand with the normal amount of effort. So really, all we had to do was breathe for the babies, and they'd make it. There are a few other things since then, a few other little complications that have been found out about. <coughs> so when I came to Ames, after seeing these several of these babies die, it crossed my mind that the various respirators that we had made, which were totally ineffective, they, people would have a whole wall full of machinery and the respirator still didn't work. But generally, the respirators had been built by physicians, <coughs> and this was the initial mistake. We thought if we could get a respirator builder to build one, it might be better. I contacted, I think the first chap came over a sore ear one night, and he was a, you have time to talk at night, and we, we got to discussing the problem. He brought around one of his graduate students, and we talked about the respirators that had been built and the problem. Now, the, the problem in building a respirator for these little fellows, as I told the graduate student that night, you have to breathe for these babies only when they want to breathe. They breathe irregularly at 120 a minute, so you have to sense when the baby's going to breathe in and have the respirator establish positive pressure on the lung within 15 to 20 milliseconds after the baby starts breathing in. And this has to be done regularly at rates of roughly 120 per minute, but it has to be, you have to monitor each individual breath because if the baby wants to breathe irregularly, he has to be able to do this. Secondly, there can be no, um, no extra dead space in the machine. A dead space, if we have a, a mask over your nose and mouth, and let's say the mask has 75 cc's of air in it, then that 75 cc's contains the last air that you breathe out and that's the first air you breathe in. That's dead space. You see what I mean by that? Now, you and I breathe in about a pint of air each breath, about 500 cc's. The women a little less, not much. The baby's total breath, this size baby, his total inspiratory volume is 5 cc's. This is a teaspoonful of air that he's moving back and forth. So the machine cannot have that much dead space. It has to be constructed so that when the baby breathes out, he breathes out to the air and gets in a fresh 5 cc, a fresh teaspoonful of air each breath. He has the, the mechanics of the machine have to be such that he has less than um, a millimeter of water inspiratory effort and less than a millimeter of water expiratory effort or he builds up carbon dioxide. He's not strong enough to get that much. And he's not, if, if you have to push out and breathe out against effort, then we build up carbon dioxide in the blood with an increase in acidity. Of course, the machine, besides that, it has to be almost idiot-proof. I remember 
when I was, I remember when I was in, in medical school, we had a, a great biochemist from England, and I happened to be introducing him. And the dean of the medical school told him in all seriousness, as he came out for his introduction, says, please, doctor, keep it simple. Remember, you're talking to physicians. <laughs> <laughs> These, this is quite true. These machines have to be almost idiot-proof. You're not only dealing with physicians who know nothing about them. They have to be very simple in their control, and they have to be arranged such that if the nurse kicks the plug out in the middle of the night or the doctor happens to stumble over it, that the baby's respiratory tract isn't totally obstructed by being attached to the machine. They also have to deliver a, a constant volume because the stiffness in these babies' lungs increases as the disease goes on and decreases as the disease wanes. So if you set up a respirator to give air up to a certain pressure, he won't get enough when he's real sick and you'll able to blow out a lung as he gets better. They have to deliver a constant volume at any necessary pressure up to some given safety point. And it has to be at a rate that we established, we had to establish at about 100 to 150, well, it worked out best at about 120 cc's per second. And we didn't know when we started when the baby wanted this air, whether he wanted it at the beginning of inspiration, at the end of inspiration, whether he wanted half of it at when the respiration was half over and the rest when the inspiration was in its second half. I had no idea when he wanted it. We didn't even have a very good idea about the infant's respiratory curve, his inspiratory curve, when he was sick. Normals we knew. And I didn't know how to get it, except by going to the library, and they didn't have it. So Dave Carlson, who was the graduate student, now Dr. Carlson over in the bioengineering department, said, well, I, could you... Uh, let me see a few babies sometime. Maybe I could work it out. I said, yes, come on up to the nursery anytime. And he came up and worked with several well babies and a sick baby. And while he was working with the well babies, he had a whole staff with him, about six people and some gear. And they went in and washed their hands and, and uh, crowded around the baby. I asked him what he was doing. We knew each other pretty well by then. And he said, well, Bill, I don't think you'd understand it. And <laughs> he worked for about 10 minutes and went away. I didn't hear from him for upwards of three months. And then he called me and said, I uh, think your machine is ready. We'd like to try it out. I'd also, uh, along with the simplicity, this thing had to be kept down to a reasonable size. Because the at that time, the best method of treatment was to find the mother who was liable to deliver one of these babies and send her into a center where she could be cared for with her baby. But these are mostly premature babies, and premature babies come rather unexpectedly. A, a couple of yelps and a telephone call, and they're there. <laughs> and they, you don't have time to send them anywhere. And they're there in the little hospital, and what we tried to set up was some something that could be used by the non-specialist <coughs> pediatrician in any little hospital. This was the original goal. So it couldn't be too big and it couldn't be too expensive. But Dave had a box about this big, and it worked. We started going through rabbits. He'd gotten the materials mostly from scrounge and uh, assistance sort of a daylight, moonlight requisition where he'd go to his professor and say, I need such and such, and somewhere he'd find it. And I must say we had nothing but cooperation from the university and the electrical engineering department. It, it must have been disturbing to come up and find a half-dead rabbit clicking away in your office <laughs> when you, the night before you left the door locked. <laughs> we had, for a year or so, we worked on rabbits. Dave and I worked very well together. 
the one problem we couldn't figure out was how to attach this thing to the baby. Because a tracheotomy in a premature baby is essentially a death sentence. For one thing, the movement of air, as you people know better than I, the resistance to the movement of a column of air varies inversely as the fourth power of the radius, or the fourth power of the decrease in radius. So when you put even a thin wall tube into a trachea, you decrease the diameter of that trachea enough so that the resistance to expiration becomes a significant factor. Secondly, the babies always bleed and leak around those tubes and obstruct, and it, you can't get the tube out and in fast enough. Thirdly, we find that with these babies, if the tube moves down a quarter of an inch, such as the baby nodding his head, well, it obstructs one of the lungs. Anyone who's ever taken care of a tracheotomy in a baby just shudders at the thought. So we didn't want to do that. I happen to know from somewhere that babies breathe through their noses, preferentially. They don't like to breathe through their mouths. If their noses are plugged up anatomically, they probably will live, but they may die, because their respiratory <coughs> efforts are not great. And they may not think about all these things at the time they need to, so that it's not unheard of for a baby with a nasal obstruction to die because he won't open his mouth. We thought we could use this, and to make a long story short, my backdoor neighbor, Ben Buck, a dental technologist, made us a mask, one of which you saw there, that fit over the baby's nose. What he did was come up at night and put a little plastic sleeve over the baby's nose and pour it, we put a couple of drinking straws about this long into his nostrils and then poured this gel trait into it, the stuff they use to make an impression on your cavity. Then he'd take it down to the lab, pour up a nose out of it, then make a mask over the nose, incorporate a couple of tubes into it, and an hour later he'd be back up in the hospital. And we'd take some colostomy cement, put it around the inside, and paste it on the baby. And the only dead space we had then was right here. The only mask we could get for a mouth and nose of a baby had five cc's of dead space. That was all he breathed. It was total lung volume in the mask. So he'd breathe out, he'd get the same breath back and forth. The way Ben fixed it up, Ben Buck, was that we got down to three-tenths of a cc of dead space, just where we had to cut out the mask to join the nostrils. Then we'd paste it on the baby. We could push air into that up to 30 centimeters of water pressure if we held his chin shut. We could get up to 18 centimeters without even holding his chin. His lips would resist that much. And it's not unusual now to, with a sick baby to see the nurse sitting there with her finger on the baby's chin so that the air won't pop out the mouth. We started working with this. The one thing that we didn't know how to do was to get a an accurate estimate of how to set the respirator, how much volume to put in. We thought, uh, really, it was, it was hard to find out, so we thought we'd figure out with each individual baby how to do this. We got one of these evening dress uh, covers, plastic covers that your clothes come home in, <coughs> seal the bottom of it, put a one-way valve on this mask, put the mask on a baby. We had a three-pounder up there. And hooked the other into this bag. We figured 100 breaths, we could catch 100 breaths, and then average them, because most spirometers had so much resistance that the, they were worthless in, in the babies. And the, we asked the baby's father. He said it was all right. So we hooked this up to the bag. And the kid did very well for about 10 breaths, and he sneezed. <laughs> well, you, know, you roll the thing up, get all the air out of it, and try again. And he lasted for about 20 breaths, then he got mad and began to cry, and that finished it. The father was rather skeptical about all this. He was Leon Arp, one of the professors of engineering graphics here. 
Yes, that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> and uh, about two weeks later, he came around with a big box with some insides to it. And you could hook this onto the mask, and without resistance, it would measure the baby's next full breath after you push the button. Not a half breath. They wouldn't settle for that. It, without any resistance at all, it measured the baby's next full breath and read it out on a little meter. This was great. <coughs> so we had a fourth member of the team. The next member came along when we, um, Dean Town asked the engineering department to have some station breaks to publicize the department on WOI. But they asked us to come over for a five-minute station break, and we did, and described the work with the rabbits. And the, produce, the producer there, Red Barnum, said, uh, I'm Red Barnum, I'd like to do a documentary on this. I said, sorry, we don't have any documentary to do. I said, haven't done anything yet. We're going to use this on babies. He said, well, how are you going to keep records? How, how, how are you going to know? I explained to him that I was going to use my movie camera because these children are very hard to record. It's hard to say how much is this baby retracting? How sick was he? And in working with a respirator, we thought we might like to go back and see the babies again when they were sick, so I decided to take movies of them. He said, how are you going to take them? I said, well, I've got my little eight millimeter uh, wind up, and I think I can do all right. A funny look went over his face. <laughs> He said, why don't you call me, and I'll take the movies. No obligation involved. So we did. We called him with the first baby we had. <coughs> the first one, of course, was a premature that was nearly dead. He really didn't have hyaline membrane disease. He was six days old, and he had, uh, by that time, his respiratory system was so inefficient that it had he really had no brain left. He was having periods of apnea lasting 10 minutes about every 30 minutes. And he was almost dead, because he really didn't dare take any other kind of baby to try a new machine on. You didn't want to take some brand new baby and put the machine on and have him die. So we put the machine on this little fella, and he didn't have any more periods of apnea for another 24 hours, when his brain finally began to fall apart and would not function anymore. But all of the things that we thought were going to happen didn't happen. It worked. Since that time, we've had, oh, probably approaching 50 babies on it, 40 or 50. First thing we found out was that these babies that are the ones that were going to die in 48 hours, don't. Those were the ones that were too sick to make it by themselves. <coughs> but if you put a respirator on them, they last on and on and on and on. We've had kids on this for, well, I think the longest one was 120 hours. And we did two exchange transfusions while he was on him while he was on the respirator. And he just about wore us down, because we had to stay with all these babies. We just slept in the room across the hall. It was simple enough. By that time, the engineers, Dave and um, Lee Arp, had temperature control devices, urine measuring vo volume devices, so that when the child would urinate, a little light would go on and a whistle would blow, and the weight of the, the, weight of, the volume of the urine would show up so the nurse could record it. And the baby could be turned every hour. We've had great trouble with pneumonia with most of the babies in the world that have been on respirators because you put a tube down a baby and hook him up to a respirator and you don't dare turn him. But with a nose mask, such as we have here, we have no difficulty at all in turning these babies. We can flip them from side to side and examine them and, and uh, it's, they're quite easy to handle. But there have been some some peculiar times. Most of the special nurses were women who were married and had children. They weren't working in the hospital, but they were willing to come in for a little while. We'd train them on the spot. I had one very, uh, 
very good nurse. She came on at midnight. I came in, oh, about 10 minutes later. She's standing there with a shocked expression on her face. Of course, all these gadgets going around, no pocket to pocket to pocket. And the, the baby almost covered up in these various <coughs> gear we had him had in him and tubes coming out of him. But she had a little bit more shocked expression than usual. She was a smart girl, a competent person. I said, what's the trouble? She said, you know Bozo the Clown? I said, yeah. She says, he just came in here in his scrub suit and listened to the baby and went over and adjusted the respirator and left. <laughs> this was Red Barnum. <laughs> <laughs> and by that time, he, he could take care of babies as well as most of the nurses in the hospital. And, uh, these <laughs> now, what you have here, this is a, an infant, and in the chest is a syringe. The respirator is working. It is being triggered by the impulse of that plunger as it falls to the bottom of the syringe. You can turn the sensitivity down on this to the point where it'll fire on the baby's heartbeat. And Carlton watched the babies and watched them forget to breathe occasionally, and he built in a memory so that if the baby doesn't breathe for about 15 seconds, it'll blow a whistle breathe for the baby at a preset rate and wait, see if the baby's going to breathe. If it, and if it does, go back to breathing for him, breath for breath. If it doesn't, it'll breathe for him again and blow another whistle. The college has the patents on this machine. They license them to Borns Incorporated, and Borns now has, so oh, probably 150 out in various parts of the world. They worked fine. One of them worked for six weeks steady on one baby in New York without missing a stroke. Then Red Barnum and Lee Arp were thinking one night about various things, about three o'clock in the morning, and Red came up with another idea, which Lee incorporated. Now that has been developed and licensed to a different company, Ohio Chemical, and that respirator's coming out pretty soon. So there are two, res two infant respirators that came out of the same little five group of people that really had no business getting together in the first place. But these, these five guys, we, went, the, we were invited down to an anesthesia meeting, the American Society of Anesthesiologists in Florida, for a scientific exhibit. The anesthesiologists would come around and start asking questions. They'd ask about the, ba the compliance of the lung and how we measured the compliance of the lung. And the various methods that why, why we like that over some other method, and the the characteristics of the flow through the nose mask. And then they'd say, "Well, now, what do you think of acetylcholine in these babies? Do you use it?" Well, I don't know anything about that. You'll have to ask Dr. McCormick. Said, Who are you? Said, well, I'm producer director of WI Television. <laughs> 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 or, uh, you know, I'm a dental technologist, and uh, uh, these men got too good to let go. <laughs> you have been listening to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, Dr. William C. McCormick of the McFarland Clinic in Ames spoke on treatment of respiratory distress in the newborn.
University Lecture is a presentation of Iowa State University Radio.